So as Christians, we take a lot for granted. We know what we are, we know that we're saved by God's grace alone. We know about the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins. But we tend to dismiss and forget about the hope that salvation brings us in the darker world that we live in. Without that hope that salvation brings, it can easy, be easy for us to have doubt and make us think that we're standing alone against the spiritual attacks on us by Satan. We also tend to not pray as often as we should. We get busy with our lives and at times we only pray when we need something. Not to express ourselves in the thankfulness to our Heavenly Father, but for things that we feel that we need. As Christians, we have a duty to be fearless and bold with our beliefs and spread the gospel to others so that they may have the hope that we have in our salvation. And this morning, we're going to look at three things. Using salvation as a helmet and God's word as a sword. Always be praying in the spirit and being fearless. And when I chose this passage, this is a couple years ago for my exegetical paper, I could not figure out why they would separate the last two pieces of the armor of God and put it along verse 18 through 20. In doing so, talking about prayer. And it took me a bit to finally come to some understanding of why, so hopefully it'll make sense to you as well when I'm done. So the first one, using salvation as a helmet and God's word as a sword. We're going to start with Ephesians 6, verse 17 this morning. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Paul uses the imagery from Isaiah 59, 17, as he describes the Lord putting on righteousness, as his breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head. Paul is telling us to take the helmet of salvation. And when I looked up take, it pointed me to the Greek dechlamai, which in this case tends to learn at receive, which makes sense since we truly cannot take salvation, as this is something offered to us because of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the equipment in the previous verse were laid out to be picked up. The helmet and the sword are handed to the warrior by an attendant or armor break bearer after the rest of the armor has been put on. The helmet is in place to protect the head of the warrior as they do not hide behind the shield. As one commentary put it, that which adorns and protects the Christian, which enables him to hold up his head with confidence and joy, is the fact that he is saved. And Paul even describes the helmet as hope in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. The only offensive weapon that a Christian wields is the sword of the Spirit. Paul uses rima as opposed to logos. So the word of God is not referencing the written word, but by actually speaking the gospel message, which is given power from the Spirit. This is not speaking a magical or specific word addressed to Satan that would defeat him but faithfully speaking the gospel to men and women held by Satan so they may hear the gospel and be freed from his grasp. Now, it does not mean that knowing the scripture isn't important. As I have also found several commentaries that referred to Jesus in Matthew 4 when Satan is tempting him where Satan was defeated because Jesus was steadfast and spoke the scriptures to re repel Satan's temptation. And if you don't know the word, the written word, how are you going to express it? Now I want to share a parable by Reinhard Bonnke. 
A man had a two-story house. He heard a knocking, opened the door, and found Jesus there. So he invited him to live in the house and gave him a room at the top floor. Jesus will only take what you give him. The man was sleeping and heard a pounding on the door, opened the door a crack, and the devil barged in. He had a terrible fight trying to resist the devil and his temptations, yelling out for help all the time. Eventually, he managed to throw the devil out, and in the morning he said, Why didn't you help me last night? Couldn't you hear me calling for help? And Jesus said, The problem is, you've got this whole big house to yourself, and I've only got one room. The man said, Ah, I see your point. So you can have the whole top floor, and I'll keep the bottom floor. The man was sleeping and heard a pounding on the door, opened the door a crack, and the devil barged in again. He had another terrible fight trying to resist the devil and his temptations, yelling out for help all the time. Eventually, he managed to throw the devil out. And in the morning, he said to Jesus, Why didn't you help me last night? Couldn't you hear me calling for help? And Jesus replied, The problem is, I have the top floor. But you still have the bottom floor to yourself. The man said, ah, I see what you mean. From now on, the whole house is yours. And that night, the man was asleep. And there was a pounding at the door again. This time, Jesus went to open the door. And he opened it wide. And stood in the doorway. And the devil looked at him, bowed very low and said, I'm sorry, but I think I knocked on the wrong door. The second thing, always be praying in the Spirit. There's a supposedly true story of a Welsh woman who lived in a remote village in Wales. She went to do a great deal of trouble and expense to have electrical power installed to her home. However, after a couple of months, the electric company noticed she didn't seem to use very much electricity at all. Thinking there might be a problem, they, with a hookup, they sent a meter reader out to check it out. The man from the electric company came to the door and said, we've just checked your meter and it doesn't seem that you're using much electricity. Is there a problem? The lady replied, oh no, there's no problem. We're just so thankful that we have your electric power whenever we need it. We turn on the electric lights every night to see how to light our lamps, and then we switch them off again. We don't want to be a, be a bother. And it's a silly but true story, because think about it. Why didn't this woman want to use her electricity more often? She believed in electricity. She believed the promise of the electric company when they came and got her connected, and they told her all she needed to know about it. She went to a great deal of expense to have her house wired for electricity. The problem was, she did not understand the potential of having electricity in her home. And so, she used the new electric power sparingly. And I suspect there are people who use prayer very much the same way. They believe in prayer. They know the promises that God has made. They've even read and heard stories about how God answers prayer. But they use the power of prayer only when they have to, and sparingly. Perhaps they do not understand how prayer really works. And they need to have it explained. And this can even be the case for church-wide prayer. Ephesians 6, verse 18 Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Paul writes that we should be praying at all times in the Spirit. Some commentators believe that we need to take the continual prayer and keeping alert and connect it back to verse 14, where we're told to stand firm as opposed to receive in verse 17. Verse 17. 
Other commentators feel the opposite is true as praying at all times and keeping alert. And that underscores the demeanor of those who take the helmet of salvation in the sword of the Spirit. The well-armed soldier in Christ's army should be continually praying and alert. Neither praying nor being alert is optional for believers. And when looking at words that Paul uses, he mentions all kinds of prayers and requests. And requests in the Greek comes to mean prayers. So Paul seemed to be emphasizing prayer here. So in verse 18 alone, pray is used four times. So this is something that Paul finds very critical. And the word all is another very important word as well in verse 18. Because it's also used four times. We pray, to, we are to pray at all times, all kinds of prayer, with all perseverance, and for all God's people. And when we pray in the Spirit, this typically means in communion with the Spirit or in the power of the Spirit. One commentator said, let the Spirit be the atmosphere in which you pray. So I want you to think of it this way. The believer's entire life is one large prayer to God. Or it should be. This is how we should be living our life. In constant prayer. We need to be continually giving thanks to God. Giving praise to God. And asking God to give us guidance and wisdom. As we make everyday and even life altering decisions. And Paul tells us to, to pray in the Spirit. As Paul wrote in Romans 8, 15, you have received the Spirit of adoption. This Spirit is what prays and enables us to pray, as we are inadequate to know what to pray for. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. We need the Holy Spirit in us to be able to pray as we should. Jude 1 verse 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Believers are to pray continually because the struggle against the darkness never ends. Prayers are to be inspired and guided by the Holy Spirit, which gives us direct access to God the Father. Even when we do not know what to pray, the Spirit will intercede for us to make sure our prayers are in line with God's will. And our third thing this morning is to be fearless. Ephesians 6, 19 and 20 says, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. In verse 19, Paul asked the people to pray for him, or rather, on his behalf. This prayer was not for him to be released from prison, or for any relief while he was in prison but that he may speak fearlessly, or better yet, boldly. And fearlessly translate into Greek is peristomy, which in this case is boldly. Matthew Henry's commentary mentioned that Paul had a great command of language and was the chief speaker but asked for prayer from the people that God would give him the gift of utterance and boldness to speak the gospel. Paul was persecuted and imprisoned for preaching the gospel, and yet he continued to preach it. If God's help was needed to pray via the Holy Spirit, it is definitely needed in order to explain the gospel. Paul was asking for unhimited speech to speak boldly without 
the fear of reprisal. In Romans 1, verse 16, Paul wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And when Paul mentioned the mystery of the gospel, he was not talking about it being a mystery to him. The mystery is that it is unknown until it is revealed by God. One commentator pointed out a helpful translation as, Make known the revelation that is in the gospel. The gospel has already been revealed to Paul, but he wanted prayer to be able to speak boldly to reveal that gospel message to those that had him in chains. That salvation in Jesus was not just for Jews, but also for the Gentiles. What was meant originally for a select people was now opened to all people. And Barnabas, in Acts 9, verse 27, told the apostles about how Saul, now Paul, had been spoken to by the Lord and how he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. But now was in prison for preaching the gospel. Paul was now asking for prayer so that he would continue to speak boldly in the name of Jesus. He was in prison, waiting to go on trial, and yet he was not done proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. Now, how many of us that are being persecuted for whatever reason is going to sit there and ask God that you can still speak boldly to share the gospel for them to be saved? We have Jesus for an example, and we have Paul for an example. No one's better than Jesus, but Paul was pretty, pretty up there of what he did. The first step we must take is to accept the salvation that has been offered to us. Without that, we cannot begin to understand God's word in order to aid us in the spiritual war that wages all around us. Without accepting the salvation offered to us, we are unable to pray in the Spirit. And we need to be in constant prayer. Luke 1, verse 37 tells us that, for nothing will be impossible with God. If we're not praying, how can we know the will of God? We can do all things through God, but by ourselves, we are very limited. Several times in the scriptures, it shows Jesus leaving his disciples in the crowds to go in prayer. If Jesus needed to pray to God as much as he did, then why do we think we shouldn't need to pray as often? The Son of God was in constant prayer with the Father. We also need to be fearless and bolder with talking to others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was in prison for preaching the gospel, and yet that did not stop him from doing so. We need to pray for boldness so that we can spread the news about Jesus and the salvation that he offers us. Jesus spoke boldly to the Pharisees, not timidly. Paul was Christ-like and boldly preached the gospel. Paul understood what it meant to speak boldly. Do you honestly think that Paul would go to people and, and ask, excuse me, but would you mind if I talk to you about Jesus? I do not think that the man that used to persecute the early Christians, who was saved and transformed, began to preach Jesus, had a timid bone in his body. He was sitting in prison, writing letters to churches to encourage them and help them grow and spread the gospel. He was sitting in prison for preaching the gospel message, and he was asking for prayer to keep speaking boldly. Paul was acting Christ-like. And speaking of Jesus, I do not remember reading any stories about Jesus being timid either. Can you see Jesus at the temple to the vendors? Um, you really shouldn't be selling these things here. 
Do you think this is really what should be happening? Nope. Jesus turned over the tables. Jesus also did not care if he offended the Pharisees by speaking the truth. He had a message to spread, and he had people to heal, and he did not care if it offended them. Paul asked for prayer to be bold. And this is just not a prayer for Paul, but should be seen as something that we should also be praying for. We're to be more like Christ. If we're afraid that we may offend someone because of what the Bible says, then how are we being Christ-like? We should know the word, speak the word, and let God handle the rest. And of course, I wasn't prepared for today for the message. But I think it's fitting. Our church is trying to find itself. Our church is trying to find out what God's will is for it here. What we're doing with the church camp property, what we're doing with the church property here, everything. And are we all in prayer like we should be? Are we letting the Spirit pray on our behalf? Are we praying that the Spirit opens us up and lets us listen to what God is telling us? Or are we just coming here once a month to make it a show to sit in the pews and act like we're actually praying for what God wants us to do? Because this is not something that should be happening once a month. And as I said, Paul was constantly in prayer. Jesus was constantly in prayer. If we're told to sit there and be more like Christ, then what should we be doing? And I can tell you it's not going off on our own. It's to sit there in prayer and listening to what God is trying to tell us. And we are only going to do that if we're in prayer, we have the Holy Spirit in us, and we allow God to take over every aspect of our lives. And it can be something minor. You should still be praying to God. As I said earlier this morning, a lot of people you see when tragedy strikes them, that's when they go to God in prayer. Because they suddenly lost control of everything. And I hate to say it again, they were never in control to begin with. And as Christians, we shouldn't think we're in control of anything either because that is not what God tells us. Everything we do should be in prayer, period. Everything. The Spirit is in us. And just like that story, if we're not giving every aspect of our life over to Christ, his hands are tied. Judy, I think I made it a week without talking about evangelism. (laughs) And I think that's because I was in conference. (laughs) It's important. If you look around, remember, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, these pews had a whole lot more people in them. We can share the gospel message, and we should be. God is the one that will fill these seats again. Nothing that we do, because all we can do is share, which we should be happy to do. God does the work. <laughs> 
And if we're not willing to do that, if we're not willing to, then why are we here? If we're not going to share the gospel message. Because then we're just misusing what God has given us. We have a voice. God gave us that voice. We should be using it to share the message that Jesus came. He died on everyone's behalf if they're willing to accept him as Lord and Savior. He's not asking for much. And it was the last command he gave before he left the disciples, go forth and make disciples. That wasn't Jesus being timid. If you feel like it, go ahead and share my message. No. Go and make disciples. It wasn't a suggestion. In our denomination as a whole, we just spent a week in Virginia talking about the whole thing. It wasn't a suggestion. We have left it as a suggestion. Now our churches are dying. And it's not just the Seventh-day Baptist churches that are dying. As a whole in the United States, the churches are dying. Unless you're one of the churches that doesn't preach from the Bible and is okay with sin being rampant and not talking about sin at all in the churches. Those are the feel-good churches that people want to belong to. They don't want to hear the tough news that you're living in sin, you need to change. And we're not here to sit there and dictate what they do because we're not the ones that judge and we shouldn't be. But you also are the ones that have to share the message. And that's why people think that Christians are troublemakers. So you won't hear this very often from the pulpit, but you know what? Go forth and be a troublemaker. Because you have the Bible behind you. You have Christ's own words. And you have the Spirit in you, directing you. So it costs trouble. Father God, we, we come before you. We're thankful for you. We're thankful for your teachings. Lord, let those teachings impenetrate us. Let your teachings show us that we need you every day, all the time. And that we need to give up control of ourselves to you. Our whole self. Not just part. Let us know, Lord, that the Spirit is in us. Let us let that Spirit speak on our behalf, Lord. Let the Spirit open our ears to your words to us. Lord, we know that even sharing the gospel, Lord, that we may be uncomfortable, but the Spirit isn't. That the Spirit can also speak through us to others. And having a conversation with others about why we love Jesus. Why we follow Jesus shouldn't be difficult. Some of us don't have a huge story of us with a significant change when we accepted Christ. But that doesn't matter. Because the message is that you love your people. You sent Jesus, who took all of our sin upon his shoulders and sacrifice himself on our behalf. And he conquered death as he rose again. Just like we are going to someday. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we can be 
at your side. We can be in your presence, worshiping you and praising you. But until then, we know that we have the Spirit living within us. And we're thankful for that. And we just give you all the praise and glory this morning for what you've done for us and the grace you've given us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.